on the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississauga of the Credit River. The territory was subject of the Dish with One Spoon One Bum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peacefully care and share for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Acknowledging the traditional territory on which we live and work is a small but important step that reminds us to learn more about the indigenous peoples in these regions, to consider the history and ongoing colonialism on this land, and reflect on how each and every one of us can contribute to reconciliation. You can visit native-land and who's.land to learn more about the land you're on and who it belongs to. So if this is your first time attending Astro Tours, we run them generally on the first Thursday of most months. Um, and we will have a talk. So today we'll be having a lecture by Yu and Juan. And then after we'll be heading over to the McLennan Physical Laboratories and we'll have the telescopes on the roof and some demos and such in the lobbies. Um, Astro Tours is organized and run by graduate students in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And our volunteers consist of undergrads in astronomy, physics, and um, degrees of that nature. And we want to make these events as great as possible for everyone. So if after the event, if you could go to bit.ly slash astrotours and fill out our feedback form, that would be great. And on the feedback form, you can also suggest different talk ideas and topics you want to learn more about in the future. So, I'll quickly just go over some upcoming events. So next month, on June, Thursday, June 1st, we'll be having a lecture by Isha Dasgupta on a rookie's guide to a deep IY star. And starting next month, we're shifting these to start at 9 instead of 8 due to the sunset time getting later. Um, and it will be in this room again, just at 9 p.m. Um, on Thursday. You can also, as always, visit the Dunlap Institute Facebook page and rasto.ca to look at other events that are happening in the area. So now on to tonight's speaker. So Yulin Guan completed his PhD in Millimeter Astronomy at the University of Pittsburgh and is now a postdoctoral fellow at the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics um, at the University of Toronto. His research focuses on mapping precise maps of the millimeter sky and extracting cosmology and astrophysics from the data of the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. In his free time, you can find him teaching cosmology to his cats. As a, <laughs> as a side note, he's also in the same research group as me and has been advising me on some of my projects, which is super cool. And I'll now pass it off to you, Lynn. Okay. Uh, thank you for the very nice introduction. I'm very excited to be here to share with you something I'm really excited about, which is uh, to map our universe in millimeter. So I'll tell you uh, why it's so interesting uh, in a little bit. Uh, before I start, let me uh, say a few words about myself. So uh, as Simon mentioned, I'm a postdoc here uh, at the Dunlap Institute uh, since uh, 2021. Uh, and my main research interest is to uh, map our sky in uh, millimeter. Um, and uh, I have been working on this experiment called Atacama Cosmology Telescope, which is a telescope in Chile uh, that makes the most precise map of the uh, millimeter sky. Uh, okay, so let me start by reviewing the basics of uh, our knowledge of light. So we know that the light has a spectrum, it's an electromagnetic wave. Uh, the visible light that we see is uh, about one part in a very uh, small range of this, uh, this uh, spectrum. Uh, so in the uh, in the shorter wavelength set, every, uh, we have the ultraviolet, for example. This, uh, this kind of light, usually you see them in, uh, for example, hospital. Uh, it's very good for sanitization. Um, and uh, on, on the shorter wavelengths, you have things like X-ray, which is so much more uh, powerful, so it's able to penetrate your tissue and give you an image of your bone, which is also used for medical reasons a lot. Uh, on the longer wavelength set, we have the infrared. Uh, infrared is something that uh, usually uh, show up in a thermal uh, camera. Uh, so you can see a couple of hot water showing up very intensively in infrared. Um, and then microwave, which is the subject of today's talk, uh, is, uh, is basically the same thing that you see in your kitchen. So this, uh, so the microwave in your kitchen is essentially powered by this microwave uh, radiation and try to heat up your food in, the, in this uh, machine. Um, I'll come back to this uh, later. Uh, on the even longer wavelengths, we have the radio wave, which is usually used for uh, telecommunication and things like that. 
So what is the main mechanism that generate all these black? So one of the mechanisms that generate less in nature is this mechanism called uh, black body radiation, which basically uh, tells you that everything that has a temperature uh, will tend to radiate black at some, some very well-defined spectrum. So this, the spectrum is basically telling you how much black is radiated at a different uh, wavelengths. For example, uh, our sun has a surface temperature of uh, 6,000 Kelvin. So Kelvin here is just a more fancy name uh, to, more fancy unit to measure temperature, so it's essentially about the same as, so one Kelvin is about the same as uh, one, cel one degree Celsius, uh, so zero Kelvin is negative uh, 200 uh, Celsius. So our sun has a surface temperature of about 6,000 Kelvin, uh, so uh, by, the, by the law of black body radiation, it will be uh, radiating most intensively at about a se a several hundred nanometers, uh, which is also happen to be uh, the visible light range that we can see, which is essentially the uh, evolutionary reason that we're able to uh, we evolved to, to see this light. Um, so the black body radiation gives us this correspondence between light and the temperature. So um, so if we uh, so we can we're able to measure light by their temperature. Um, so the black body radiation is one of the main mechanisms that generate all these beautiful uh, colors in the night sky that we see. For example, here is this uh, one beautiful image of our night sky. So you may be surprised that it looks like uh, this kind of egg shape, um, whereas the, the, the full night sky is actually on a sphere that surrounds us. Uh, this is just the one way that we like to project the full uh, sphere onto a, onto a plane, which is very similar to uh, how you do that for, for uh, Earth, where you just uh, unwrap a globe on, to put it on paper. Uh, so this will be how we visualize something on a sphere. Uh, so if, we, if you zoom into any part of this uh, nice sky, you will see this beautiful image with all kinds of uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful colors, and all these colors come from uh, some stars uh, that radiate uh, because of the black body radiation. So they radiate different uh, different color and, different, uh, and this different color tells you um, uh, the internal temperature and that tells you the mechanism of these different stars. So by uh, taking, by observing on the universe at different uh, wavelengths, we're able to understand their nature, uh, the nature of all this stuff that we see in the sky. So here's another image, uh, another example to show you um, uh, the power of looking at the same object at different wavelengths. So here's the image, a famous image from the, uh, the Pillars of Creation. On the left is an image made by visible light. On the right is if we look at the same object in uh, infrared imaging. So you can see that in infrared we can see a lot more uh, star in the background because, uh, because all these uh, structures uh, in, the, in the visible light are blocking, are blocking the light behind, but it's not blocking them in infrared. Uh, which means that, that by measuring in uh, different wavelengths, we are able to see a lot more, uh, understand a lot more about the structures here. So here is uh, the image of the entire universe um, in infrared. So you can see that it's uh, radiating very uh, violently in the uh, galactic plane, but whereas if you compare that to our uh, visible light, so you can see that it actually looks like a different universe. In the visible light, we actually don't see that much radiation uh, from the black plane, uh, but in infrared they radiate very intensively. So this is exactly the same reason that you see a hot cup of water uh, radiate in infrared because there's a lot of uh, dusty structures in the black plane and then they are very hot, so they, uh, they, are, they radiate in the infrared more than they are in the visible light. And here is yet another image, uh, actually made in X-ray. So this is uh, uh, made by this uh, satellite experiment, uh, Eurocida. And this is yet featuring another kind of universe, uh, which is not visible in, uh, in our optical light. So here is featuring a lot more energetic event, uh, such as all these uh, interesting structures uh, that you see here. So all of this is to tell you that by observing our universe at a different wavelengths, we are able to learn something new from different wavelengths about the same structure. So, okay, so now we come to the uh, main subject of our talk is uh, we want to uh, look at our universe in uh, microwave or in millimeter. So why is this so interesting about uh, uh, measuring it in millimeter? So first of all, what is the, uh, what is the microwave uh, and millimeter wave? 
So essentially, uh, this is just a classification for uh, for leaves that goes be from, for example, one millimeter, which is uh, one, which is the smallest scale on some kind of ruler that you have. Uh, from that to roughly about a meter, which is what you use to uh, distinguish uh, social distancing. Um, so what's so special about it? Uh, the, what what makes the microwave so special? Uh, why, why do we want to measure our universe in this frequency? Okay, so I'm about to show you an image that we first made uh, of the microwave sky. Okay, you ready? Okay. Okay, so this is a real image uh, made by a Kobe satellite when they first made a full uh, full map of the universe in uh, in microwave. So you can see this this look just look like a fake image. Um, I, so you can imagine when people first discovered it, they are really surprised. So there are these two guys who, who are working uh, in the Bell's lab. So they were working on some uh, communication uh, technology. They tried to uh, communicate with some microwave satellite. So the satellite is, uh, uh, is a very faint source, so they need to characterize their, so their instrument as much as possible. Uh, so they need to rule out the, all sorts of the noise. Uh, so what they found is that uh, after they rule out all possible sorts, there is just the extra noise that seems to be uh, there, no, no matter what they do. So they even uh, come up with the hypothesis that there could be some pigeons in the instrument, but it turned out that's not the case. Um, so they, uh, what they found is that uh, they found um, some kind of uh, excess noise uh, that's all over the place. Uh, it's roughly about 3.5 Kelvin, uh, and it's isotropic and unpolarized. So what does each of these mean? Let me uh, decompose each of these terms for you. Um, so what does it mean by uh, 3.5 Kelvin? So if you remember this black body radiation diagram that I just showed you, so everything that has the temperature will radiate uh, by a, with a special uh, distribution uh, in terms of the frequency. So where is a millimeter? So a millimeter is if you take this, uh, if you take this, uh, uh, this x axis here, and if you multiply that by roughly about a thousand, um, and then you go to millimeter. And so that's where all these uh, microwave emissions lie, um, and it's going to be much bigger because the, the, the lower the temperature, the bigger it is. Uh, so if uh, uh, so for a microwave, uh, for, for anything that radiates in microwave, it's going to have a very low temperature, and it turns out that temperature is roughly about uh, three Kelvin. So this could be real. Uh, so this explains this uh, three point five Kelvin that uh, they observed. So uh, and the next term is isotropic. So what's so special about this isotropic? Um, so isotropic exotro means that uh, the temperature of this radiation is uh, is the same everywhere. So what's so, what's so special about that? Uh, so, so if if this source, so whatever source that, that generates this uh, nearly uh, nearly uniform, um, nearly uniform radiation, uh, if it's from Earth, uh, then you would expect it, it, you would expect it to not be uh, uniform because if you can, for example, uh, move closer to Earth uh, or move uh, further away from Earth, uh, they will be very different if it's coming from Earth. Um, and if it's coming from our solar system, so you would imagine uh, it will be very different depending on where you are away from the Sun. So, so if, it's, uh, if the source of radiation comes from our solar system, it will also not be uh, the same everywhere. And that's the same case. That's also the same case for uh, our galaxy. If this radiation comes from our galaxy, you would expect it to be uh, not uniform. It will be, uh, be more concentrated in where all these uh, galactic planes are, and not uh, on the uh, other side. So you will also not be uniform. So the, the fact that it's uh, isotropic uh, all over the sky really tells us something unique about this source, which is that this source is very likely uh, not coming from. Uh, even the, uh, our galaxy, so it must be extra galactic source. Um, and then you also said this light is unpolarized, so let me uh, just give you a quick review of what this means. So we know that light, although uh, it seems like, uh, seems like a particle, but it actually has a direction, so this is uh, called the polarization. Um, so light is, uh, is made of this uh, oscillating electric, uh, electromagnetic wave, um, and then you can have a preferred direction. So in this example, um, I'm showing a light that's perpendicular 
to my particular that's particular, uh, but uh, that's not necessary to have a lattice uh, um, colors in any directions. So in fact, in an environment that's completely uh, completely uniform, you would expect to have uh, light polarized in all directions, which means it's not polarized. Um, and in order to generate something that, uh, in order to generate polarization, you would need some kind of medium uh, that has the preferred direction. For example, you could have some kind of polarizing filter. Um, and this filter, what it does is that it's going to filter out all these other directions that only left uh, one particular direction. And this is the mechanism that uh, that's behind all these sunglasses, which is essentially is a polarization filter. So the sunlight uh, shines on some kind of surface and it gets reflected. Uh, usually it tends to be partially polarized. Uh, and then your, your sunglass is designed to filter out that kind of uh, polarization. Um, so that's just uh, uh, making use of the phenomenon that light is polarized. So, so to summarize, in order to generate polarization, you would need to have some kind of environment uh, that has a preferred orientation. So for example, in the case of a polarizer, you need something that's, uh, that's particularly oriented in a certain direction in order, to feel, in order to generate polarization in that specific direction. Um, so the fact that this excess noise that we see in microwave is unpolarized means that whatever generates has to be extremely uniform. It has to be no preferred direction there uh, in, the, in the whatever generates. Okay, so this is the on the observation side. On the other side of the world, which is the theory set, um, so this is the time roughly about 1960s. So people are starting to uh, realize that all these distant galaxies are actually uh, moving away from us. Uh, so this is a phenomenon called the, um, the hubble matrix law, which states that the further away a galaxy is, um, the faster they are moving away from us. So how did we uh, figure that out? Uh, so it turns out each of these galaxies here, uh, they have some particular uh, chemical compositions. For example, they have hydrogens. And the hydrogen tends to absorb certain radiation in the environment. So you can see them. Uh, if, you, if, you do a, if you look at their spectra, you will see some kind of absorption lines. So these absorption lines is essentially some kind of a signature for each of these galaxies. Um, and when we, when we actually make an image of them, we can see this signature at uh, different wavelengths. And this is essentially uh, uh, the phenomenon known as the Doppler effect. So you may be familiar with this uh, in the physics class. Uh, where something that travels with speed, if you, if you look at a wave generated by a source that's traveling with a speed, uh, if the source is traveling towards you, you will tend to, uh, you will tend to observe uh, a frequency that's higher than if the source is moving away from you. And by measuring the frequency of the, the wave that's generated by the source, you're actually able to tell uh, how fast each of the sources is uh, moving. So, um, this is exactly the same phenomenon here, where uh, we uh, measure the uh, how how much the, this absorption line gets shifted, um, and uh, uh, we are able to figure out how fast away they are traveling away from us. And if we uh, if we sort of tabulate that against how how far away they are, we realize that the further away, the faster they are traveling. So this is uh, some kind of really bizarre uh, result that puzzled physicists for some time. So uh, how do we explain this uh, kind of uh, expansion? How do we explain, explain this kind of uh, uh, linear relation? Uh, one very intuitive model is the, using the expansion of the universe, uh, which is that you, if you can imagine that uh, all, these, all these galaxies are uh, some kind of ladybug on top of a glowing, uh, on top of a exploding sphere. Uh, so, as, uh, so as the sphere ex uh, expands, and all these uh, ladybugs become further and further apart, and the further away they are, uh, the, farther, the, the, more, the quicker they are moving away from each other. So this will be uh, the most natural explanation for, uh, this, uh, for this kind of uh, hubble nature relation that we observed. So the, the, the real question is, how do we actually verify if this is true? Um, so this is the focus of a few uh, physicists at Princeton. So they, um, so in, in 1960s, uh, people think that this question is unanswerable. So these are, uh, to figure out what really happened in the, in the beginning of the time, uh, is really something like a fantasy. Nobody is able to figure it out. But uh, these people are uh, very persistent, and they try to 
uh, come up with some idea to actually put this into test. Uh, so they come up with this very simple but a very elegant idea, which is that uh, if our universe has expanded, uh, that must mean that uh, in the very, in the very uh, past, it must be much smaller. Um, for all of this stuff to be concentrated in a much smaller volume, uh, it's going to be very hot. Um, and everything that has, has a high temperature, as I mentioned earlier, by plant radiation law, uh, by the black body radiation law, we know that um, it has to radiate light. So essentially, they hypothesize there is going to be this cosmic radiation uh, left from the universe is uh, in the very early stage, in a very hot and dense stage, um, that's going to be uh, exist with us. So if this cosmic radiation is uh, really exists, uh, you will experience this effect known as the cosmological redshift, uh, which uh, which uh, is this phenomenon where uh, a light radiated by a distant source. Um, uh, as the as the light travel from a distant source to us to the observer, uh, the universe expands. As the universe expands, it tends to stretch out this uh, light, uh, so it becomes redder and redder. So if this uh, if this cosmic radiation were to really uh, be there in the early universe, you must have experienced a lot of cosmological redshift, and it has to be really stretched out. It has to be really, has a very long wavelength, and they expect this wavelength to be roughly at the millimeters. So on the, on the theory set, uh, so the physicists, uh, they were looking for some kind of radiation background uh, that exists everywhere. Uh, and also they expect it to be in all directions and also unpolarized because they think the universe, the early universe has to be uh, very uniform. And it's also because of this cosmological redshift is also likely to uh, be stretched to a very long wavelength. Uh, so, on the, so this matches very nicely with this is, um, uh, this excess noise that's being observed by Panzia and Wilson and Bell's labs. So they also observe this astrotropic and polarized light. So this is a very nice uh, confirmation that maybe we're actually detecting this universe, uh, they could be detecting this uh, cosmic radiation from the early universe. So in order to actually convince us that that's actually from the early universe, there's another thing that we need to check, which is that uh, if, it's, if it's radiated by the mechanism, this black body radiation mechanism is also going to have a very well predicted uh, spectrum which tells you how much, uh, how much uh, intensity you, you have at different frequencies. So uh, scientists uh, have proceeded and uh, measured this. And here is a measurement by this uh, first experiment. Um, so, uh, so you can see this shape matches very well with the shape on the, on the left from our theory expect, expectations. And all these little bars here, these are our uncertainties. So although it may look like uh, these error bars are pretty large, but uh, you need to notice that this, they are actually uh, multiplied by 400. So this is actually 400 times the actual uncertainty. Otherwise, you will not be able to see it. So this is actually one of the most perfect black body that we have seen uh, to date. Um, so it matches very nicely with our prediction uh, that if this that this actually comes from um, the early universe. So this is uh, the, uh, the discovery marks the discovery of this thing we call cosmic microwave background, or uh, CMB for short. Uh, the fact that we uh, detect this is that uh, it provides the first evidence of this Big Bang universe. So now we know that universe has to start from something that's very small and very small and very dense and very hot, and then it gradually expands and, uh, and then cool down and generate all these structures that we see uh, in the universe today. But we know that this picture is definitely not uh, fully complete uh, because, so here are some images of the next guy. What's so special about these images uh, is that uh, they are not uniform. So they don't look like all this uh, strange green image that looks the same everywhere. So they, they have all these kind of uh, inhomogeneities or uh, non-uniformities uh, in the image. So where does all of these come from? Um, so this it really tells us the universe is very far away from uh, uniform. So all these structure has to be seeded somewhere, somehow from this uniform background. So this uniform background has to have some kind of uh, fluctuations on top of it. 
so we need, we need to be able to verify that. So um, this, uh, okay, so, so this begins the next stage of our adventure in microwave um, measurement of the, uh, in mapping our sky in microwave. So, which is the mission is to search for this informal community which sees all the structure that we see today. So this is the image, uh, the same image that I showed you from the Kobe satellite measurement of the uh, sky. So it turns out they have the sensitivity to actually uh, measure even smaller fluctuations. So if you actually um, zoom in uh, by roughly about a thousand times, uh, this is what you will see. So you will see this very strange uh, um, kind of that, uh, bipolar pattern. Um, if, you, um, if you have an instrument that's a, a thousand times more sensitive. So what is this pattern? If you put this on a sphere, it actually looks like a dipole. So you have a hot pole on the north and so a cold pole on the south. So what is, what is this? What is happening here? So uh, people come up with a very natural explanation for this, which is basically this Doppler, same Doppler effect. So if we live in this sea of cosmic radiation, uh, our Earth must be traveling with some speed with, with respect to this radiation. So that means on one side of it, we will experience this uh, uh, Doppler effect. We'll see something that's hotter than uh, on the other side. So this is actually um, evidence that we are traveling uh, in this sea of cosmic radiation. So if you uh, zoom in even further, uh, by another 100 times, now you can start to see some really interesting structures. Uh, so first of all, you can see the galaxy here. Uh, and then you also notice uh, that there is all these kind of random blobs, which is something that's really exciting because we could really be uh, seeing all these seed, uh, all these cosmic structures that we see today. Okay, so um, so the uh, so since uh, the COBE measurement is you can see is uh, very uh, blurry, so the next stage of the uh, exploration is basically try to map these inhomogeneities as precisely as possible. So we have uh, gone through a series of experiments uh, from COBE uh, to this uh, another satellite experiment called the WMAP, which makes uh, a lot clearer the image of these inhomogeneities, uh, and then eventually. Uh, the plant which provided the most state-of-the-art measurement, uh, one of the most state-of-the-art measurements of the sky. You can see this improvement in our uh, resolution uh, in terms of uh, mapping this, all these inhomogeneities on these millimeter emissions. So this is the, uh, the same image made by Planck for the entire sky. So on the first look, it may look uh, very random, like uh, this is just look like some kind of static noise uh, on, 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 a, on an app shape. A sphere. So what's so special about this? Uh, so you, actually, if you uh, do some kind of special measurement from this, you can actually measure something really interesting. Uh, so what, this is what we are going to do. So let's just take uh, one particular point, for example, uh, a point uh, here, and then we ask ourselves a question. What is the probability of another point that's roughly about uh, uh, 90 degrees away from this point? What's the likelihood that they are going to have roughly about the same temperature? And then you can, you can ask this question for all points that are 90 degrees apart. And then you can ask another question, what's the probability of two points that are, for example, 45 degrees apart? What's the probability that they have the same temperature? And then you, do that, and then you can do that all over the sphere and try to measure this probability. Um, and then you can do that for even smaller angles, for example, 10 degrees. What's the probability of two points that are 10 degrees apart have the same temperature? And then you can collect all of them uh, and put them on this diagram. So on this diagram here, horizontally, it tells you, uh, it tells you all these different angular scales uh, that we measured. For example, this 90 degrees point tells you how likely it is for two points that are 90 degrees apart to have the same temperature. And here, for example, is two points with uh, 0.2 degrees apart to have the same temperature, and things like that. And uh, and then this, uh, this vertically shows you the amount of, uh, amount of uh, power in each of these uh, kind of uh, two point uh, in each of these measurements. So you can see that when we, when we uh, put this random map into this kind of uh, special calculation, uh, we reveal some really interesting structure in this uh, seemingly random map. So we see this kind of uh, uh, peak here, 
uh, we also see some uh, wave-like patterns, which are really interesting. Uh, so we, now we actually understand how these uh, waves come from. So in the early universe, we know there's going to be a lot of radiation. So all this radiation is going to have uh, this uh, strong pressure to push structure outwards, if you imagine that. Uh, and then on, on the, as the um, competing force, you have the gravity, which is try to gravitate and, and, um, and try to push, push stuff together. So, uh, so this computation gives you this kind of oscillation pattern, like a string. And uh, the, it, it is exactly this kind of oscillatory, um, oscillatory uh, pattern that we observe in this, um, in this random map, in the random map of this cosmic sky. So what can we learn from this? So one thing that we can learn is uh, we can learn something about dark matter. Uh, so if you have never heard of it, that the dark matter is this kind of invisible matter that we have proposed uh, to explain some of these mysteries in the, uh, in, in the universe that we observe. For example, here is the example, it's a classic example of, of the evidence for a dark matter. So this is a, um, a galaxy rotation curve, which is uh, to measure uh, if, for example, we look at look at the star and see how fast it travels uh, around the galaxy, and then you, you expect this uh, traveling speed to be sort of depend on the amount of uh, amount of matter inside the radius. Um, and then if if you just account for all this matter, you can see uh, you will get a very different prediction for how fast this a star is supposed to rotate. Um, but that's not the same as what we measure. So what we measure is uh, is a solid curve. And uh, this is what we would expect from only everything that we can see. So this really tells us that there is a lot of things uh, in, the, in the galaxy that we can't see. And that we, for something that we can't see, uh, we call them the, the dark matter. Uh, so it turns out if the universe consists of a lot of dark matter, uh, if you do this analysis on, that I just mentioned on this random map, uh, you will get a very different spectra. So on different angular scale, you will have a very different amount of uh, uh, fluctuation. Uh, if you have different amount of dark matter in the universe. Um, so uh, just by measuring this uh, spectra very precisely, you're able to have a very good knowledge of how much dark matter actually uh, is in the universe. And similarly, we can also, uh, we can, this can also tell us about, for example, dark energy. So uh, if you have never heard of it, dark energy refers to this, uh, this phenomenon that we have discovered, which is our universe actually Start, uh, not only expands, but also expands faster and faster. So it seems like that some kind of uh, invisible energy is uh, trying to accelerate the expansion. So we call this dark energy. Um, so if you have different amount of dark energy in the universe, it actually also has a very noticeable effect if you look at this kind of, uh, and this kind of uh, spectra of the millimeter sky. So uh, what it does is that it tends to push us or, uh, all these waves around from left to right, so it tends to shift your spectrum. And similarly, uh, we, there are also many other uh, physics that affects how this, uh, how this spectra look like. Uh, I, will not, I will not go through them one by one, but uh, uh, for each of them, uh, we, we can predict how it changes this spectra, and then we can uh, cross-match that with the